So modernism spans a huge variety of artists and kinds of art from about 1860 to 1960. Um, and modernism, as we've been talking about, really broke away from convention and tradition and sought to modernize art to match the modern world. Modernists were, you know, trying to emphasize originality and innovation. Um, and really, modernism is based on idealism and universal principles. Modern art often adopts industrial materials and machine aesthetics, clean lines, cohesive forms, etc. But it also tends to shy away from utility and instead adopt an art for art's sake stance. However, in the mid-1960s, uh, sort of between abstract expressionism and, and pop art, kind of, we really start to see this shift away from the idealism and universalism of modernism towards postmodernism, uh, sort of a shift towards post-industrial capitalist society living in an age of mass communication that really required tolerance for difference and rapid change. So this shift kind of begins in the 1960s, but the term postmodernism was actually popularized in the 1970s, and then the movement really develops throughout the 1970s through the 90s. Um, postmodernism emphasizes individual experience, acknowledging that truth, knowledge, morality, all of this exists in relation to culture, society, and context. It's really grounded in pluralism, this sort of recognition that there is no one right way of doing things, no universal style or theory. Many postmodern artists continued to question the very nature of the definition of art and to break down the hierarchies of high and low art. They argued originality was unachievable in a world so overloaded with imagery. They really embraced appropriation, borrowing existing imagery directly from mass visual culture, recycling it into new contexts to twist or complicate its meaning, to deconstruct modernist ideas about originality, artistic identity, and authority, and to expose how consumer culture and the mass media constantly bombard us with images of lifestyles that are ultimately impossible to obtain. One prominent postmodern artist is Jeff Koons. Um, he's sometimes labeled as a neo-pop artist because he really makes the relationship between art and commerce explicitly clear within his works. He embraced the ambiguity of pop art to both elevate and critique everyday subjects. In the 1980s, he started appropriating consumer goods and kitsch objects considered to be in poor taste because of their excessive garishness or sentimentality. He exhibited things like basketballs and vacuum cleaners in plexiglass display cases, and he hired skilled craftspeople to replicate lowbrow, mass-produced, imitative or decorative things like balloon animals, um, figurines, tourists by, etc. Except he makes them, or has them made, I guess, in an absurdly large scale using high-quality materials. So his sculptures are based on pop culture, and they sort of satirize consumer culture and high art, but they're also intended as sort of lavish, expensive luxury items for the wealthy. The effect is to place the object's artistic status directly alongside its commercial value and underscore its dual role as both economic and cultural commodity. So for example, we have Jeff Koons' 1988 Pink Panther here. Um, it's a roughly life-sized figure made of porcelain, colored in sickly sweet candy-like colors of pink, aqua, and yellow. It's maybe a little bit uh, similar or kind of recalls Andy Warhol's Maryland diptych and its attention to celebrity culture, but in an even sort of kitschier way. Coons modeled the um, partially nude female figure here on the 1950s film star and sex symbol Jane Mansfield. And she's sort of striking a pose while cuddling the very popular Pink Panther cartoon character from the 1963 film. The garish color and the slick texture really imply this cheap artificial beauty. And it's somehow both celebratory and critical. 
Another artist who embraced appropriation during the postmodern era was Sherry Levine, who questioned the nature of artistic originality and authority. Levine produced a provocative series of photographs that were actually reproductions of Depression-era photos taken by Walker Evans. Evans worked with the Farm Securities Administration in the 1930s, and his images were used as evidence of poverty in the South. Levine directly appropriates Evans' work, claiming the legacy of the well-known male artist for herself, seemingly criticizing his approach as the appropriation of destitute subjects for his personal, artistic, and commercial gain. Additionally, as exact copies of Evans's images, Levine's images highlight photography's resistance to how modernism tends to value most highly the original work of art, and it really forces us to consider the influence of mass media on cultural knowledge. For some, postmodernism's challenge to the status quo seemed like an attack on Western culture's most fundamental values. Throughout the 1980s, tensions grew between factions opposing beliefs about religion and politics in what is sometimes referred to as the culture wars. In the art world, conflicts raged over freedom of speech and public funding for the arts, particularly with the regard to the right to make art that might be considered offensive or obscene by others. At the center of these debates was the National Endowment for the Arts, or NEA, a federal agency established by Congress in 1965 to provide funding giving Americans the opportunity to participate in the arts, exercise their imaginations, and develop their creative capacities. In 1989, Andres Serrano's controversial photograph titled Piss Christ drew national attention and criticism from religious groups and conservatives. Although Serrano had not received public money to produce the photo, the Southeastern Center for Contemporary Art had paid him a stipend to include the work in an exhibition that had been organized in part by the NEA. Serrano's work was created about two years prior, in 1987. It's one of many photographs by Serrano that involves bodily fluids like urine, blood, semen, or human milk. Serrano says that the function of these is to highlight the tension between his image's aesthetic appeal and the abject undertones, here made more clear in the title. The printed photo is nearly two feet tall and quite brilliantly colored, showing a Christian crucifix in hazy, ethereal light. Serrano made the image by submerging a small plastic crucifix in a plexiglass container of his own urine. Serrano, who was raised in a strict Catholic family, argued that the work addresses the physical death of Christ's body and critiques the commercialization of Christ's image. So one year later, in 1990, a retrospective exhibition of photographer Robert Maplethorpe came under similar attack for its inclusion of homoerotic or sadomasochistic imagery, including self-portraits of the artist. The show was ultimately canceled and the museum director was arrested on charges of obscenity. The same year, the NEA rescinded grants awarded to four artists because their works included lesbian, gay, or radical feminist content. The artists sued and won back their grants in 1993, but an obscenity clause was added to the NEA regulations, requiring jurors to consider the general standards of decency and respect for the diverse beliefs and values of the American public when making their awards. Over the next few years, Congress and the House of Representatives dramatically restructured the NEA and cut its budget by 40%. Debates about public funding of art don't always stem from moral or religious outcries, however. Instead, many revolve around art produced for public spaces, as we saw with um, Richard Serra's Tilted Ark. Another controversial public installation of the same era was Maya Lin's Vietnam Veterans Memorial. A jury of architects and sculptors awarded Maya Lin, the, who was a student at Yale at the time, the commission for a monument to go inside the National Mall in D.C. Lynn had proposed a simple, dramatic memorial cut into the ground like a V-shape, um, or in a V-shape, kind of like a scar on the earth. Um, and she intended this as a symbol of national healing over the divisive Vietnam War. The memorial sits between the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial, kind of pointing towards each one. 
It consists of slabs of polished black granite, each about 247 feet long, that meet at a 130 degree angle where they are about 10 feet tall. This change in scale enhances the viewer's experience as the sculpture seems to grow in height, overcoming and sort of dwarfing the viewer as they progress down the lengthy plane. The slabs themselves are inscribed with the names of 58,272 American soldiers who were killed or who went missing in action during the Vietnam War, listed chronologically from 1956 to 1968. The memorial serves to commemorate the dead and missing, but also to provide a place for survivors to confront their own loss. Maya Lin employed polished black granite, the kind commonly used for tombstones, that reflects the faces of the visitors as they read the names. The effect is both to humanize the written words and to implicate the viewer who now bears witness to the national tragedy of war. Lynn purposefully tried to take an apolitical approach to make the work be about those who had sacrificed and not question whether the war was shameful or honorable, but the politics of the time weren't completely unavoidable. For example, the best black granite, at least at this time, came from Canada or Sweden, both of which were countries that draft dodgers had commonly fled to, so it was quite difficult for Maya Lynn to import the material that she wanted. Now, at the time of its completion, Myelin's design was strongly contested and critiqued. One opponent said, One needs no artistic education to see this memorial for what it is, a black scar and a hole hidden as if out of shame. Some argued the stone should have been white instead of black, and that her use of abstraction um, was sort of seen as this departure from the representational monuments that were traditionally used to honor war heroes. In 1983, in response to this criticism, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund commissioned another artist, Frederick Hart, to create a more naturalistic memorial depicting three soldiers, and this was placed about 120 feet away from Maya Lin's memorial. Then in 1993, another sculpture of three nurses by Glenda Goodacre was added about 300 feet to the south to really commemorate the contributions of women during the war. And then a flagpole was also added uh, sometime during this time. Now, Maya Lin was really opposed to these additions, but she was ultimately overruled. And so I think this example, as well as that of Richard Serra's Tilted Ark and even um, Serrano's Piss Christ, these kind of raise important questions about the rights and responsibilities of artists, as well as the obligations or responsibilities of those who fund, commission, and exhibit works of art. So now we need to look at architecture from the mid-century to the post-modern period. So we looked at Mies van der Rohe's uh, Seagram building in New York previously, and so this really exemplifies the international style that dominated urban construction in the mid-20th century, with its plainly visible structure, its rejection of past styles, and its lack of ornamentation. However, around the mid-century, some architects began to depart from the very impersonal principles of the international style, using new structural materials and techniques to create more expressive designs. So for example, Frank Lloyd Wright's Guggenheim Museum in New York, which was completed in 1959, originally the Museum of Non-Objective Art, it was built to house the personal modern art collection of Solomon R. Guggenheim. But the building itself is sort of a sculptural work of art in its own right. Wright's design sought to contrast with skyscrapers like the Seagram building and to really challenge traditional museum architecture, which is often very classical in style with a sort of ancient Greek style temple-like facade with columns supporting a continuous entablature and pediment. Wright's Guggenheim Museum is instead a spiraling organic shape made possible with precast reinforced concrete slabs. The museum galleries spiral downward from a glass ceiling, wrapping around a five-story atrium. Wright intended visitors to take the elevator to the top floor and then walk down the spiraling ramp, looking at the art along the way. 
So throughout the 1970s, architects continually moved away from the sleek glass and steel boxes of the international style. In fact, it's in the realm of architecture that we find some of the earliest references to postmodernism. Critic Charles Jinks used the term to describe the buildings that abandoned rationality and minimalism and moved away from the idea that form must follow function. Instead, postmodern architects reincorporated elements of past styles and other cultures into their designs. They did not seek to revive any one style, but mixed things from different times and places in eclectic ways, choosing elements for their symbolic meanings and adding playful references to contemporary pop culture. One of the most prominent early postmodern architects was Robert Venturi, who really rejected the abstract purity of the international style by incorporating elements of vernacular or popular, common, ordinary sources into his designs. Where Mies van der Rohe had argued less is more, Robert Venturi parodied that sentiment with his own less is a bore. He accused modernists of ignoring human needs in their quest for uniformity, purity, and abstraction, and encouraged postmodern architects to embrace eclecticism and address the complex, contradictory, and heterogeneous mixture of high and low architecture in modern cities. Between 1961 and 64, Venturi designed and constructed what we now call the Vanna Venturi House, a home for his mother, which really implemented many of his postmodern ideas. The shape of the house's facade returns to a sort of traditional Western house shape, which the modernists had rejected. But Venturi uses um, triangles and squares sort of arranged in a playful, asymmetrical way that kind of skews the harmonies of modernist design. He also incorporates purely decorative elements like the curved moldings that were forbidden in the international style. The deep cleavage over the door there, um, this kind of disrupts the facade and reveals an upper wall and the chimney top. Um, the interior is also quite complex and contradictory with an irregular floor plan that you can see kind of in that drawing on the previous slide. Um, but it has this odd stairway that sort of um, wraps up and around the chimney of the fireplace here. And then um, irregular ceiling levels and then on the second floor this partial barrel vault as well. Um, here's another great example of postmodern architecture, this time by American architect Charles Moore, who really sought to design inclusive architecture that anyone could enjoy. This is his Piazza d'Italia, an urban public plaza and fountain in New Orleans constructed as a monument to the city's Italian citizens. The piazza is a theatrical combination of mismatched references to historical styles and contemporary vernacular architecture. There are references to historic Italian architecture, but the elements are combined in historically inaccurate ways. For example, the five concentric colonnades or rows of columns, um, they're made with modern materials, including concrete and stainless steel, and then they've been painted in these sort of bright colors, yellow, ochre, and red. Um, but more kind of brings together five different classical orders, mismatching different historical periods into one structure. Um, and then it's a little bit hard to tell in the photo, but neon lights also trim the structure and kind of illuminate and animate it at nighttime. By the 1980s and 90s, computer-aided design or CAD programs with 3D graphics had really transformed architectural design and practice. These new tools enabled architects to design structures virtually, calculate engineering stresses faster and more precisely, and to experiment with advanced building technologies and materials, and to really imagine new building compositions and break out of the restrictive glass box of modernism. Additionally, in the early 1990s, deconstructivist architecture emerged to deliberately disturb traditional assumptions about harmony, unity, and stability in architecture. Deconstructive architecture tends to be decentered, skewed, or distorted in design. 
It also plays with meaning by mixing diverse architectural features, forms, and contexts. So this decentering is accomplished through the perceived instability of both form and meaning. A good example of deconstructivist architecture is Frank O'Gary's Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain. Now this is not to be confused with the Guggenheim in New York, which was designed by a different Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. There are two, uh, two architects named Frank and two structures that we call the Guggenheim Museum. But Frank Lloyd Wright's is in New York, and then this Frank O'Gary's Guggenheim is in Bilbao, Spain. Gary's structures are quite dynamic, often with curving wing-like forms that sort of extend quite far beyond the main mass of the building. And this is true of the Bilbao Guggenheim. Gary developed his design using a CAD program that enabled the powerfully organic sculptural structure. The complex steel skeleton is covered with a thin skin of silvery titanium that shimmers gold and silver. From the north, the building sort of resembles a living organism, changing with the weather conditions or the time of day. From other angles, including this one, it looks more like a giant ship, which is a reference to the city's shipping industry. The interior is even more irregular, encouraging the viewer's awareness of the space as they explore.